Hello, so today we are gonna have another um, afternoon of gluten-free prepping, okay? Gluten-free pre prepping is kind of a misnomer because most gluten-free, most canning, uh, like what I'm about to do doesn't have flour anyway, so it's kind of funny. Most people don't realize that when you can, you don't generally use any kind of flour. Um, and I'm just doing kind of a simple, easy, um, straight meat uh, kind of canning. So these are things, so here I have six pounds of ground beef. It was a 90-10 that, that I was able to get on sale. All I did was brown it really well and the, the juice is all dried. I didn't rinse it, I didn't drain it, I didn't do anything like that, okay? It's just six pounds of ground beef. These are brand new jars. This is a brand new package. I literally just opened it. So I'm gonna make this really simple, okay? Because sometimes I find that the fancy canning, um, they're, they make it a little complicated. And I'm not for complicated. I'm for making as simple as possible. I do not, now, this is a meat canning video. You're gonna watch me prep these jars um, and put food in them. Everything's cold, okay? Um, when you boil the jars first, that's generally for a water bath canning, and this is not water bath canning. They're gonna be sterilized. They're gonna be in a high pressure canner. I live in, in, in a high altitude, I'm at 6,000 feet, so I have to do everything extra. So most people at sea level are going to 10 pounds of pressure. I'm going to 15 pounds because that's the minimum for my elevation. So I don't, I prefer cold canning. I will do hot canning sometimes, but if I can avoid it, I do because it strips this, it just handling all the hot jars and the hot soapy water and all that heat, it's hard on my hands and um, it takes more time. I have to be more careful not to burn myself. So if I can do it cold, I will. Look, I've got six pounds. I'm gonna pull seven jars just in case. I'm just gonna rinse these really, really quick, put them on a towel, and I'm gonna start to load in some ground beef. So I, all I did was rinse the jars really quick. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, so we're ready. It's a lot of materials you do have to have out. This basically encompasses my entire <laughs> kitchen counter. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is, we're gonna go ahead and use, these funnels are kind of important. I do have the matching fancy kind of scoop, but that's not the end of the world. The goal is to get all of the beef in there as packed as, kind of as packed as you can, and then I fill the spaces with water, okay? Um, like I said, this is a simple canning. Um, you'll probably see me do a bean one. I think I'm, what I'm wanting to try and experiment with is maybe like a Rotel style recipe. So all I'm gonna do is take my bare hands, push this down a little bit. I have to maintain that one inch of head space. You see that, one inch? Now keep in mind, I am not an expert canner. I've been doing this for about, I've been doing it for about a year and a month. So at this point, um, I've gotten pretty comfortable with my pressure canner. I was quite nervous the first time I used it, but I did this. I watched lots of videos on YouTube. I saw people do it and I'm like, this doesn't look that hard. I need to just bite the bullet. And so I did. Um, ever since I've been canning all kinds of recipes um, and enjoying it. And I, I like having food stored up. I like having company over at the last minute. Can I just open up an extra jar of ground beef or jar of ground turkey? Um, and I just throw it in whatever meal I'm doing and voila, I have enough food. So, and I'm not worried about cooking it. Oh, I have to defrost it and brown it. I'm, I'm, I probably have ADD. I have all kinds of things going on and kids crying in the background, kids fighting in another background. And um, so I'm on my fourth pint and you just have to get a feel for what you're comfortable doing. But for me, this just plain meat is ridiculously easy. These pints should take about a pound a piece, but sometimes they don't. It's probably a little closer to three quarters of a pound. Um, and to be brutally honest, the reason I'm not using quarts is because I can't fill as many. So if I use quarts, I can only put seven quarts, I think, in my canner. But if I do pints, remember two pints equal a quart, I can usually do 16 to 18 pints. 
So it's, it's the equivalent of more than just seven quarts. So in order to fill it and make the most use of time and energy with gas and heating up the house, I do my best to um, can as efficiently as possible. The first couple times you're doing it, it's fun and you're like, oh wow, you know, and I'm gonna do lots of quarts and I have lots of quarts that I purchased to use, but I haven't been using them as much because the pints, um, I can just fit more pints in here to, to be, you know, the equivalent of more food. I can't talk today. So I'm gonna push these down a little bit. I really should have more, be able to fit a little bit more in here. You do wanna leave your one inch of head space. Um, the important part about that is that you don't want any siphoning of liquid because in a pressure canner, go ahead and put it in there. In a pressure canner, you have it's so much more heat that, um, that sometimes all that pressure will force more than just the air out of the headspace. So you need some, I, I try to err on the side of caution and have a little bit more um, headspace than not. I also do have a plain jar of water here so I can fill in the space. I, sometimes you can use beef broth or if I'd left some of the liquid in there, but I had a kiddo helping and, and he cooked all the water off. So and no biggie. And like I said, I didn't drain this. I didn't rinse it. I feel like when you do that, sometimes you lose some of the flavor. And I like the beefy flavor and I wanna hold on to that. Cause this is an easy topping for a gluten-free pizza. Um, but in terms of prepping right now, I feel like it's really integral to have a lot of options for how you store your meat so you're not concerned. My freezer is full and I just don't have any more space. In fact, after I'm done with this ground beef, I'm going to go ahead and chop up about 10 pounds of steak that I, I bought, it's about nine pounds, and I'm going to continue to fill jars until I fill my big canner. This is a Presto, I wanna say it's a 21 quart canner. Um, I got this because we had the pressure gauge in the front. And it's, a, it, it's nice, it's safe, you can see the locking mechanism. But having this gave me more security that I was gonna have any issues, because I was a little nervous, to say the least, the first time that I canned um, beef, or any, anything in there. I don't do, I mean, you're supposed to wash these with hot soapy water and stuff. These are brand new jars, I've never had an issue. So I just give them a quick rinse, and I keep going on my way. And it looks like these six pounds actually filled eight jars. So that gives you an idea. And I apologize, I got a one-year-old in the back that is fussy. I may have to put him on here in a few minutes, take a break, a commercial break, and put him on so that he's not I will put a link below to the National Home Food Processing fancy website. I reference them quite often. I look up recipes there first. I look at pressure there. I look at cooking times there. That's where my go-to to start, okay? I also do have a, one of the ball canning books, which has been invaluable. A lot of amazing recipes that I've used in there. As I continue on, I will, I'll, I'll definitely have you guys follow along because I enjoy the canning. I'm, I'm the type of person that really likes seeing the fruit of their labor. I like seeing it there, okay? So I'm just gonna be a little cautious because I don't know what I'm gonna use this for. I'm gonna put a half teaspoon of salt in each one. A half teaspoon, you can go as light or heavy. This is kind of the neat thing at canning is that you can personalize this. If you really like pepper, add a good little, add a quarter teaspoon of pepper to your dish or to your jar. Um, I have not done a whole lot of meals in a jar. I've done a little bit, but I plan on mastering that probably in the next few months because how can I put this? I don't want to do any extra work. I don't like doing extra work. And this is one way to cheat the extra work because it's all done. It's all in a jar. I guess when I do my chili, that's kind of the equivalent of a meal in a jar because when I do canned chilies with ground beef or turkey and um, beans, I'm assuming I'm gonna open that up, put it in a taco shell, or heat it up, put it in a taco shell, and I'm done. Or put it on top of chips, 
like nachos and I'm gonna be done. I'm not doing anything else to that, so. But I just added half a teaspoon of salt to each jar. This is just cooked ground beef, 90-10, okay? You will see fat, a little bit of fat in there. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to add water. This is just filtered water up to the um, one inch um, headspace. These are just basic canning tools. This little guy I really liked because the, it has, even though they faded, the markings for the headspace, which become more important. Oh, I don't think you can see that. Um, becomes more important as you start canning different things. So when I can um, jellies and jams, it's a little bit different. The whole point of this funnel is to keep the edges uh, as clean as possible. And so you have as little, um, spilling out but the reality is i still have to clean these the rims and the jars that's an absolute now when i'm doing soupy things like tomato sauces and stuff i'm a terrible person and a little on the lazy side i don't poke my jars uh, but with something like this where the jars are i'm running out of water where when i put the water in i know that there could be air bubbles trapped then I'm going to definitely poke in there because I want to pop all those air bubbles because I don't want too much headspace. If I have a little bit more than an inch, I'm fine. But if I only have, but I if I have a lot of hair, air, you know, a lot of headspace, I need to add more water because in order for the for this to process properly, you have to have the proper headspace. You can hear my children in the background playing as loud as they possibly can. One of these days they'll get quiet. One of, these days. of course, I do not know where my fancy poker is, so I'm gonna use the either the, the silicone side or the wood side. All I'm gonna do, hold on, child mayhem has started to calm down. Now, you can see a little bit of fat. You see that? That's okay. It's going to give it a little bit of flavor. I have not had any big, big issues um, with fat in my in my meats when I can. But what you do have to be careful of is you try not to have too much fat because the fat can interfere with your seal. OK, so this is going to be a simple recipe. I don't want any failures. I check on my I check on my seals afterwards. But so the process is you put the meat in. You put water in to fill up because you don't want to leave it dry. You can't do that. I'm poking now to get all the air bubbles out. And then last is I clean the rims to make with vinegar, okay? Now I use vinegar because I want to make sure that I'm getting any grease or food particles off, okay? Because it's not good to have grease or food particles on your rims, they won't, they won't hold. I've probably canned somewhere in the ballpark of three to 400 jars at this point, and I have had one failure. And I know it's because I didn't decrease the meat and it was a sloppy Joe mix. So I literally, that's, that's the only one. And so I always check them. I don't put away my jars for at least 20, usually 48 hours at least. I try not to, or I leave them in a place where I can check on them. And then after about two to three weeks, then I kind of rotate them in, into the deep, long-term storage. This definitely falls in the realm of long-term storage because if you put these in a place that's dark and cool where they will be undisturbed, like say in our guest bedroom bed even, where there's a bed skirt blocking the light, you put them in back in these trays, these nice little cardboard boxes, slip them under the bed and forget about them. And you know they're there if you need them. You know you have six pounds of ground beef in jars if you need it but it's, it's a nice alternative to not have to have in the freezer or in the fridge. So next I've got a paper towel. I'm gonna take my ginormo jug of vinegar. This is the only way to buy vinegar. I soak it, okay? This is not a little dab. I really want these rims squeaky clean. Even if there's a dash of meat, it always happens. You get a little bit of food on the um, outside of the jar. I try to wipe it off, but it's not the end of the world. This rim is everything. If I accidentally touch it or one of my kids grabs it like this, it must be rewiped. Simply because the oils from your skin will stay on that rim. And you don't want to failure when you need the food. 
So I'm gonna reposition my little towel to make sure that I'm getting this clean. Sometimes I kind of, you can just do the very tip like this, but see, now these are done. Now here you see, I grabbed the edge of this rim. I wanna kind of get the whole, at least like I'd say, a fingertip depth along that edge and make sure it's clean. Okay, and I'll wipe it again. I wanna make sure that's really clean. These are brand new lids. This was a brand new pack of jars. And I kind of like this. The other thing I really like about doing this is besides the fact that it makes meals easy, we plan on doing some camping, um, maybe some RVing. We've, we're looking at travel trailers and such. And I like the thought of not having to slave away at the stove while we're having family time like that um, because it's already done. You know, all you have to do is mix it, add your spices, get it warm, and it's done. So. Some people do uh, canned meatballs and, and little meatloaves. I have not tried that yet. I may in another video, um, but I do try to follow the national home processing, you know, I, I look at all their guidelines. And I know that you, I hear stories all the time in the Facebook groups that I'm in about how their grandmothers did it a different way and they didn't have any problems. And that's all fine and good. I try to err on the side of caution. If I don't have to take a risk, I don't. Um, I usually have my little magnetic wand here, but oh, you always need one of these, always. Um, but of course I do not know where it got placed. So we're just gonna handle it, but we're, I'm gonna be careful. So if my kids are helping me, I don't let them handle these. Um, I basically will only, I will handle them. My hands don't touch the rubber band. Okay, and there you have it. And I don't, my, I don't have very strong hands, so I turn it as hard as I can. But the reality is I'm gonna grab this lid, I'm going to place it on that clean rim, and then I'm gonna screw the top on. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm done. For all intents and purposes, that was the hard part. I prefer, like I said, having my little magnetic rim thingy to hold it, but that's all I'm doing. You put the meat in, you add your liquid, you clean the rim, and you put the top on. Okay? This is so easy, and that's kind of what I wanted to impart to you because I've made jellies and jams, and I've made apple butter, and let me tell you, they are delicious, and it's fun. But it is messy. You have to, you really are supposed to sterilize your jars first, and it is a hot, sticky mess in my kitchen when I do that kind of stuff. I much prefer this because I can start at seven o'clock at night and I'll still be done by dinner time. Or not dinner time, by bedtime. So there you have it. That's six pounds of ground beef canned in pint jars, eight pint jars, ready to go. So I'm gonna load this in my, my canner and I'm gonna get to work cutting all that beef. That by far will be the hard part. That's actually why I wanted to go ahead when I saw these, that were, they were the same size as the roasts. I went ahead and I bought the sliced steaks because now all I have to do is cut these up into strips and I'm gonna load them straight in. So if I wanna do an Asian stir fry with them, I can. I just need to have some coconut aminos um, handy and I'm done. So give me a second, I'm going to place these. Oh, you guys can watch. I'm gonna place these in my canner. This is, if I remember correctly, this is a 22 quart Presto canner that I bought on Amazon. Love this thing, it's sturdy, it's good. I would have loved a ginormous all-American canner. It does have a rack at the bottom. And these canners are very specific. You have to put the amount of water that comes in your specific canner's instructions. So my Presto canner said that whenever I run this, I'm going to run it with three quarts of water. So the first thing I do is I load it. And I'm just, I'll show you what this looks like. I try not to jam them too tight um, because you don't want the glass rattling against each other. You don't want stress ever put on these jars. Um, 
My mom once asked me, she's like, you know, why don't you just use a butter knife to, to do the popping of the bubbles? And I was like, because you'll scratch the inside over time. And you don't want to do that to these jars. Um, these jars you can use again and again. And sometimes you pick up these old antique jars and I imagine what a history they have inside. You know, what farmer, what did they preserve in here? So you see my eight jars. I think I should be able to fill at least one more. I'll show you what it looks like here in a second. I've got eight jars in there and I think I have space for one more. So let me just go ahead and I have diced and sliced about 10 pounds of um, a thin steak cut that I purchased at Sam's. Okay, it's right there. And this is gonna be the base for the next jars I fill. If I have any meat left over, it'll probably be dinner for tomorrow night. Um, I don't need this in front of me anymore because I already cut everything. But I am leaving one glove on because I will need a dirty, uh, a, you know, a meat hand to start filling these with. So these are all clean jars and you can see they're ready to go. All I'm gonna do is put this meat in here and jam it full. Now, I don't want it so tight that it's absurd, but I want it pretty darn tight. And you heard that, that was the smack of my jar on the darn granite. So the other thing I forgot to do was put a towel back down. Have something underneath your stuff. I'm just gonna adjust the camera because I had it on slow-mo and it was kind of in on me, yep. Now, in terms of these different, of the meat that I'm using, this is just a really simple steak that was pretty lean, okay? I wanna say it was an eye around or something like that, roast that was cut up into little, um, into thin slices. And I like that because it's so much less work. When you have a big old honk and five pound roast that you have to slice your way through and cut into small chunks, it's time consuming and it, it takes your energy, okay? So here I've got another one. Now the wide mouth jars are definitely ideal for this. See how I have this just a little high? Hold on, I want you to see this because it's important. See how this is just a little high? I'm gonna take some of this out, that's too much. I need the headspace, especially with raw meat. You have to make sure. I err on the side of less is more, so you see that? This is the ring I'm shooting. This ring right here is what I'm trying to use as my guide. Okay, I wanna be just under that. So then I keep going. But I'm using a mix of jars simply because that's what I have. It's what I have on hand. Um, in terms of the cut, you always want something really lean. I have purchased stew meat just already pre-cut, I trim off the fattier pieces and use that as well. That's, I mean, our time, it does have a value to it too. I didn't mind paying an extra 50 cents a pound for uh, meat that was already cut, you know, cause it saved me that much time and effort. So the dangerous thing comes when like what's happening now where the prices of me, I was purchasing my roast and I'm, I'm out here in the Southwest. I was purchasing my roast for somewhere in the ballpark of like 350 a pound in bulk, okay? Just through my local Sam's Club or, or Costco. 350 a pound. That was maybe three weeks ago. Um, I ordered my food this morning early, so it's to be delivered by Instacart. I am an Instacarter, and I couldn't find anything in the ballpark. Everything I was ordering, A, they had no stew meat. They had very few roasts. I usually, when I'm looking on my phone or on my computer Instacart, I see a whole page of different meats. It was half a page. There were seven options. Um, and on top of that, how few little selection there was, they didn't have my regular stew meat and everything was higher by $1.50 to $2 a pound. So what I was paying $3.50 to $4 for, I am now paying $5.50 or $6. So that was a little disheartening to say the least. And you can pretty much use any meat you want. I would not suggest a really marbly steak. You don't want something that's gonna release a lot of fat, okay? You want a little of flavor and the fat is necessary for that by all means. 
but not that kind of fat. And meat does not, it will create its own juices. Oh my gosh, that was almost nothing. That's funny. I'm gonna go ahead and put, I do have canning salt. You can use regular salt, but canning salt is a cleaner salt that won't give you a, like a residue in the water is what I'm told. I have not tried regular salt, so I have no idea that it will really leave a residue, but I, I bought the bag and so I use it. And I'm gonna use a half teaspoon of this. In each jar. This was not nearly as messy as the ground beef. So I'll clean these rims, but I'm not worried about nearly as much of like the fat and the grease because this is not cooked. And then I'm going to add a, I'm going to add just a heaping half teaspoon of my, my Montreal steak seasoning. Actually not heaping, just even. Like I said, I don't like to commit it to, um, to what I'm doing necessarily, but I'm not fond of bland beef either. So this is a quickie dinner where I throw this in a pot and warm it up with some potatoes or throw it in a pot with some uh, beans. I want it to be ready to go. So I'm going to clean my jar rims. And like I said, I am checking these every time because I want to see if there's anything on there. Because if I wipe something off, I'm going to hit it a second time to make sure it's clean. And there we have it. They're clean, they're wiped off. Again, I don't have any kids. You can start on your stuff. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and put these lids on. These are all brand new and if they're not, I have, I have a box with some left. Um, I won't even begin the controversy over reusing your lids today. <laughs> Just use new fresh lids, especially when you're starting out. And if you've never done this before, just so you can see, that rubber seal all the way around is what creates the suction with, with the edge of the jar, okay? And these are all brand new. I take up they're new, I don't even bother. And if you're gonna um, pressure can, you absolutely do not need to boil your lips. It does not make a difference because all you're doing is re-sterilizing them and it's just not necessary. That is how you prep. So that's my canner. I'm gonna put three quarts in there. I'm gonna put my jars and I'm gonna start heating it up. I have loaded all my jars and I wanted you to see that. So I hope I'm not doing anything terribly naughty because these are jammed in there, but I didn't have any other way to do it. I need to fit all of this in there. <laughs> so I also put three quarts of water per my instructions, okay? So now all I'm gonna do is my lid, Unless you have one of the, the nicer all-American all canners that have a clamp, okay? If you have one of those, you do not need to really do this because you do not have a gasket like I do. I have a gasket. This is probably one of the parts I realistically long-term should have spares in case this goes out because this controls everything. So I dip my finger in a little bit of oil and I oil my gasket a little bit. This is just to make sure that it's not gonna become brittle and crack and wear out fast. And I do that almost, if I'm canning all day, I'll do it for once in the morning. I won't do it every time. Then I take my canner. I pull it out a little bit to get the lid on it because my microwave is a little bit low. I'm looking at where I line up my arrows. Just that little arrow that's right there. and I lock my canner in place. It's nice and tight, it's not going anywhere. I do have to scoot this back a little bit to be centered on the burner, okay? But I turn, see now I'm paranoid. This should be a little bit tight. Check your stuff, ladies. 
This should be pretty firm. You've, I've got another little emergency plug here. Only because I'm on camera. There we go. I'm gonna tighten it. Now I'm gonna turn this because I have to be able to see that dial. I've got to be able to see that. I have to be careful. I've got a tight situation here. I'm gonna back this up and show it to you a little bit better. This is snug, okay? Because my microwave is right here overlapping on this lid. So I make sure that my canner's locked really tight. I make sure that my valve here has clearance, this valve has clearance, and I turn this on. Now, this is my second to smallest burner, okay? This is my big mama, the one that heated the, <laughs> the, the handle on my microwave is started to melt because this is where I do all of my cooking because this is my biggest burner, okay? But I have made the mistake of pressure canning over here. Number one, I can't wedge my microwave open. And number two, I had wicked siphoning. That means I could see that some of the liquid came out of the top, okay? And it's still sealed, but I think it's because the big burner heats it up so fast. So I use my, a very, a smaller burner for sure to turn this on and get it going. And I'm gonna set this at about a five. And all I'm doing now is waiting for this to start venting. When this starts to vent, I set my timer for 10 minutes. I let it vent for 10. And then I put my little knobby dancing thing on here. And I watch the pressure build to 15. And when it hits 15, I set the timer again for the time. And I'll have the final time in there. Um, and I will also have links to the, um, the National Home Preservation um, website so you can see that as well and and always pay attention to your elevation and your pounds of pressure because you have to reach your proper elevation your proper pounds of pressure for your particular elevation this is sometimes when I'm finishing up a round of canning um, you can see here this little guy rose up a little bit not sure if you can see that when it starts to pressurize, after I've let it vent for 10 minutes, I put the bobber on this gauge back here. Okay, popped up. And this gauge right here popped up just a little bit. So now all I hear is a little bit of pressure coming from this bad boy. Okay, I don't tinker with it. Um, it's pretty much going. And look at the pressure here. I'm not sure if you can see that. So right now I'm probably at about two pounds of pressure it's just slowly starting to climb so i'll come back out here every 10 15 minutes and just check on the pressure and as soon as it reaches that 14 15 mark i turn the heat down just a little bit because i don't want it going up anymore but we'll be back and you can see the finished product good morning i'm a little more quiet because the baby's asleep but i wanted to show you guys the last step of taking the jars out <clears throat> All I do is twist this, twist this off. And let me tell you, it is eight o'clock in the morning. I turned this off at about 12.15 last night, 12.05, and it's still warm. And these are my jars. Okay, and all I did is set them over here for a couple of the rest of the day. I'm probably into tomorrow morning, I'll put them away. I'll take the rings off. I did have a smidge of siphoning. These are still pretty warm there. I can hold up the glass, but it's it feels pretty warm, hot, almost hot. And you see that? It probably had a smidge of siphoning right there. But I haven't had too much of an issue with it. I don't know if it's the altitude or what, but... Some did, some didn't. I can drop these even with my bare hands because they cool enough. There you have it. That simple gluten free canning um, and prepping. The most important thing is to just have it and be ready. To make sure you put in a kind of a not drafty spot when you finish. So you see here, this little spot in the kitchen on this counter. It's between the fridge and um, and the stove, and it, I really don't have a vent straight on it. 
<clears throat> Why? Because you don't want them to cool overly fast. Okay, you want them to slowly cool because that cooling action is what um, part of the process of them sucking down and the lid locking. I can see all of my lids locked. Um, tomorrow I will double check them when I take the rings off. Some of them siphoned a little bit and what happens is at the bottom, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see that, um, the bottom of the, the water is a little bit oily because if any of the bottom ones siphon, um, they release fat into the water. So my canner smells ha ha like cooked meat. Um, it smells like cooked meat and it looks fatty. And that's okay. I can't tell you how many times I've had it look like that. Um, a lot. So after these have completely cooled tomorrow and like before I put them away, I will wash these under, I will take the ring off and run them under the tap with hot soapy water to get all that grease off. And had I put a splash of vinegar like I meant to, it would have helped break that down so they weren't so greasy, but I did not, so. I don't know if you can see that. You couldn't see the film of grease on the top. And the water looks a little dirty. It happens a lot. Um, I try not to stress it. As long as they're all cleaned after, before they're put away and check that they seal, that's what counts. So subscribe and save and watch more.